Well, we seem to be uh, avoiding all the water. Uh, we had uh, some clouds come around recently, and we looked over there, it was raining, over there it's raining, and it seemed like the clouds just went right around us and then moved on, and we now getting pretty dry where we are. I don't know about your place, but ours is getting pretty dry. So tonight we're going to have to get the water out and start watering some of our plants. <clears throat> As a little nature uh, story, just recently I uh, put out some fertilizer and um, I got some fertilizer stored in, in my barn and I went into the barn and I looked at the fertilizer and it looked, looked good. Okay, so I, I brought it outside and I just put my hand into it and, and I felt something move and on, on the left hand side there was a scorpion <laughs> and the scorpion came out of the fertilizer it seemed to like the fertilizer and um, so I was lucky I didn't get hit by it I didn't get hit but I could have it would have been right on my hand you know so that was a big lesson to me and make sure you know stir around <laughs> prod have a good look and uh, be careful with these things so anyway, we've seen quite a few scorpions around our place. I said to Seppi, it's a wonder we haven't been hit yet because there's quite a few of them, but we haven't. So um, yeah, they're interesting little creatures. So they went crunch. Every time we see one, they go crunch. <laughs> That's their sound. <clears throat> okay, well, we're in Romans chapter 9, and this is, honestly, this is another one of those big movements for me personally. There's certain items that in my life as a Christian I have I wouldn't say put aside I just didn't really address in a systematic kind of way and so the man his nature and his destiny I have addressed that front on I have now almost finished my uh, first pass through this huge doctrine of Calvinism and I haven't finished, I'll uh, never finish, of course, but as far as my satisfaction goes, I need to translate all of chapter 9 for myself. So once I've finished my own translation of chapter 9, then um, I'll feel a lot more uh, fulfilled in terms of uh, my understanding of a lot of the details. But I have got a lot of this down, and the things that I've found I want to share with you uh, today. So let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time that we have together to open the Scriptures. We ask Your blessing on the service, and Lord, uh, as we seek to understand, we know that we have so much to learn. We ask that Your Spirit would uh, work in our minds and our lives, that we could understand the deep things of Thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, um, just before we get into our um, study, I was thinking about some of the things that are going on in the news and in Missouri, um, the Planned Parenthood has really shown its true colors. Well, you might say it's shown its true colors from its founder on, on anyway, uh, Sanger, uh, who was really just a complete racist and an uh, out and out murderer, really. Um, but now, Coming right out to the front, where everyone can see it in Missouri, uh, Planned Parenthood is basically teaming up with the Satanists. And I mean, when I say Satanists, I mean out-and-out out Satanists. And it's very interesting to see this going on. And Breitbart has got a good uh, article on this. Planned Parenthood has battled against state regulations requiring abortion clinics to meet the same surgical center standards as full hospitals and for their doctors to have hospital privileges and in April a federal court sided with the abortion giant. Which is true, you know, this Planned Parenthood is a massive organization and it has quite a bit of support from certain left-wing areas um, of the country. So we need to be in prayer for those people who have got a ministry trying to show young women that there is an alternative. And the thing that we need to understand, too, is that the forces of evil really are coming forward massively. And I think we've got a president who is starting to see this and understands this quite well. And if you notice, 
Uh, certain of the news media, and when I say certain of the news media, I'm talking about mainly organizations like Breitbart and the conservative type outlets. You'll see in there from time to time um, news of Satanists who have been arrested for all sorts of activity with young children. I mean, some of the worst possible things are going on and arrests are being made. And as far as I can understand, a lot of this is being pushed through the president that he wants to get this done. But the mainline news media is not at all publishing it. It's on the hush. They don't want to talk about it. But um, this is something very interesting to me that's going on. So we need to be in prayer for a lot of the groups who are trying to minister to young people, young uh, women who find themselves pregnant, had a, a lifestyle of being taught the wrong things, and have uh, got themselves pregnant, and now what are they going to do with this child? And um, uh, there was a, a, a lady in our fellowship in Auckland, and it, she said to me that uh, she had a, an abortion. It was the worst thing that she ever has done, and it was something that was on her mind always, and it was something that she really wished she'd never done. And I think that's another aspect to this, too, that a lot of people want to do something that has a kind of a quick fix aspect to it. But the reality is you are a human being and you, you know that you are extinguishing and taking the life of another human being. And that's not something light. Even in wartime, even in wartime, I know this from talking to soldiers, that when you kill a human being, something in you dies. You know, it's, it's no small thing to take a life. And even in war, you know, even in wartime, when you know, that's the enemy. That's, you've got you've to kill the enemy. Even in that sort of situation, still, something in you dies when you do that. Okay, so uh, this is uh, part 30. Man, we're up to number 30. <laughs> And uh, so last time we were looking at John's gospel, and I don't going to go, I'm not going to go through all this, but I want to just remind you about the fact that we have been looking at this idea, and I'm going to show you a slide of this soon, that um, Christ, he comes to the earth, uh, he, the word takes on flesh and dwells amongst men. And this is the Christ. It's not simply that this is a great prophet. And in John chapter 6, this comes up very, very plain, where you have these two great miracles, the fourth and fifth miraculous signs. And those who are prepared to say, take this Jesus as just being a prophet, okay, we'll grab him, we'll make him king, Jesus will have nothing to do with it. And then the next miraculous sign is the I Am. And the I Am appears walking on water. Pictures of the deity of Christ. The statement, I Am. And then the ship lands at, at, on the land. Right? It comes to land immediately. Christ takes on flesh. The Word takes on flesh. And He came to His own and His own received Him not. He came to His own his own things, and his own people did not receive him. And there needs to be a lot of wax on that. But for now, we'll just we'll skip that and just move on. So over here in John 6, what you have is you get a rehearsing of what happened. So at the beginning, you have multitudes coming out to listen to Jesus Christ. No doubt about it. He had a big impact in the beginning of his ministry at the, about the age of 30. Massive ministry. And then what happens is you start to see that the, they start to move aside from him. And the, what happens is, as is recalled here in John 6, there is a hardening that takes place. And they talk about this statement that Jesus says that unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, well, then essentially you do not have life. And this was a hard saying, the Bible says. Hard. This is a hard saying. And what you begin to see is a hardening going on. Now this hardening was not something which expresses an eternal decree 
that God decreed that there would be a certain number of people who would be lost and a certain number of people who would be saved. There would be the reprobate and there would be the elect. No, no, that's not at all. What happens, people had the free will to choose, but when they started showing signs of rejecting Jesus, the Christ, God manifest in the flesh, then what happens? Well, then God starts to harden them. And He hardens, he hardens them for a reason. And the reason is that a greater purpose would be accomplished. He uses their rebellion to accomplish something larger. And I'll symbolize that by the cross. Okay? This great stake that Christ was placed on. Okay? So there is this hardening. And through this hardening, God's greater purpose was put in place. Okay? Now hold that thought. Right? Of course, during this time, there were some whom God showed mercy on. Now, those people who showed mercy on, they were in a similar sort of state to the others, except that God moved in their lives, in some cases, in a very special, special way, like, for example, the disciples, like, for example, the Apostle Paul. Well, did, has Jesus appeared... When you got saved, was that on the road to Damascus? Was it something like that? Did Jesus come down to you like that? No. That was a very special event that happened. All right, so there was, there was mercy being shown here. And those people, well, yes, they received the truth with a free will. There's nothing in any of this hardening or mercy that has to do with an elective purpose where the elect, they are the ones only that will be shown mercy, and the reprobates are the ones that are hardened. No, no. That's not it. Everyone makes a choice, and then God uses their choice for whatever purpose. That's fair, isn't it? In fact, we can see this play out in our own lives as parents with children. We too, there's some time, right? Anyway, over here, at some stage after the cross, there is the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the giving of the Holy Spirit is a very significant act. And some people want to make this giving of the Spirit to be something that marks the beginning of the church of which we are a part. We know that's completely false. That is a false notion. This is a part of the outworking of God's purposes to do with Israel. Pentecost. Complete Israeli feast day. The Spirit of God came, empowered His witnesses. But, and you'll see multitude. In fact, you can read about the multitudes that came. There was a huge impact there. All right, so again, you get this same thing happen. At least at first. And then, as Paul goes from synagogue to synagogue, then you begin to see some reaction. Right? Reaction starts to come. And then you find a hardening occurring. But at the same time, there's still mercy. You'll see some who will see mercy and they will get saved. But from both of these groups, this springs from their own decisions. God in all his wisdom, will harden people who go against his purposes. But it must be for some other purpose. My question to people who understand what I'm talking about, I want to ask you, and those people who know what I'm talking about uh, concerning the mercy and the hardening, I want to address you right now. For what reason is this hardening going on here? And during the book of Acts, you see, and this is where our ministry has such tremendous things to say. Over here, you can, you can explain this. You can explain what went on over here because God had a purpose for the cross. And that makes sense. I understand that. But what about over here in the book of Acts? Which we're going to go to in the form of Romans chapter 9. Right? In Romans chapter 9, you've got the same sort of thing being documented for us. 
but it must be for some greater purpose. Well, what is that purpose? And that purpose, we know, and certainly in this church, and historically it's been taught here, uh, that purpose has to do with the revelation of the, the mystery, where the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. The nations. And this was a part of the mystery. What was this? Well, this had to do with the mystery of Christ. This is part of the mystery of Christ. And this here is the mystery of Christ. In the sense of this is the culmination of Everything that God was doing, whoa, we've got a swinging mind here. Don't want that. And now I'll get this uh, thing right on top of my face. Okay, there it goes. So, this has to do with uh, the outworking of God's purposes to do with Christ. While over here, the salvation of God being sent to the Gentiles in this context had to do with the mystery which was hid from ages and generations, kept away from the prophets and given to Paul the prisoner. And that's important. Why the prisoner? Because when we read in Romans, we're not talking about that ministry. This is a ministry that would come after the book of Acts. So here you got Paul the prisoner, and over here in the book of Acts, we have various books written by Paul, one of which is Romans. So we're going we're gonna to go verse by verse through Romans, not now, but in the long run. We're going to go right through it. I'm going to finish my translation of Romans, which I'm go going through at the moment. And once we've finished it, we'll go verse by verse, and show you what, what the, what's going on here as it relates to this hardening and mercy. It's brilliant. It's Honestly, this is one of the great things um, to learn. So uh, I'll quickly go past this. We're talking about, we've talked about John and all of these things to do with the hardening and the I am passage. And we saw this, uh, you know, the father is drawing, acting on libertarian free will. He's trying to draw people out. During this time, when there was hardening going on, during that same time, there was this drawing of people, trying to bring them to himself. And at the same time, this hardening of the rebellious. Okay, now I got this from Welch. Now I want to say something about Welch. Welsh is a, was a great commentator. I mean, one of the greatest, I think. Great commentator on the scripture. And you've got to give him a, a lot of credit for the devotion that he had, like Bullinger, to the scriptures. And he, he spent his life on this. Um, and I really enjoy reading his commentaries. However, I want to say this. I will part company with him on some of the things in Romans. Not many things, but he doesn't really wax on about the issues of Calvinism. It's not, I'm not going to say that he skirts by them. He just doesn't put enough emphasis on, in my opinion, this idea of the elect to understand it. Because this has been an issue. This, this wasn't an issue in his day. It's been an issue for a long time, you know. So I think it needs to be looked at. But one thing he's got right is this idea of the scope of the passage being given by its structure. So there is definitely a structure in the scriptures, and there's a structure in Romans. And there's this inner and outer sections of Romans. So here you've got this outer, right? The outer uh, in these two parts here. So notice here that he's got this doctrinal section here going from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 5, verse 2. Then you've got this other one here, which he's called dispensation, chapters 9 to 11. And that, chapters 9 through 11, is right where we need to look. Okay. So, you notice that he has labeled it dispensational. 
or dispensation. That's correct. That is exactly right. Let me just show you that to you now. So look at chapter 9. I want, want you to see this in verse uh, number 1. I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience, also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. He has a great conscience here. His conscience is alerted to the state of Israel. Look at verse 4. Who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Just go through all those expressions and words and you'll see the great glory that was supposed to be for Israel and also the great responsibility. Look what it says. Adoption, glory, covenants, giving of the law, service of God, promises. Man, it's massive. This is the subject of Romans 9. Come across to chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Wow. Look what he's talking about. My heart's desire. In the first chapter, conscience. Then heart's desire. Now look at chapter 11. Verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. In no way. God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. And it goes on. God hath not cast away his people. Ah. So one of the things we know about the Romans, which finds its place in the book of Acts, is that Israel, though disobedient, was not cast aside. That's its state. During the writing of the book of Romans, Israel, there was Paul's heart's desire that they be saved. His conscience was so imbibed that, you know, he could even wish that he himself were cursed with God. And Israel was present in the sense that God was still dealing with it. That is so important to understand. First of all, the place and purpose of Israel. Now going back to chapter number 9, it says this in verse uh, 3, or verse 2, uh, that I have great heaviness, this is Romans 9 verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Now I'm going to hold off on too much commentary on this because there's some interesting stuff to do with the verb here, which I'm going to just finish with. And so I'm not going to comment on things that I have not completed. Verse 4, who are Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh? Remember my picture at the beginning over here. Christ came who is over all. God, blessed forever. Amen. And it says in verse 6, now comes the big point. He says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 12, there you get a promise to Abraham and his seed that the whole world will be blessed through Abraham's seed. All right? It's very clear that he's talking about his multiplied seed. Now, we know that Jesus Christ was ultimately the seed, but... In the context of Genesis 12, it's the multiplied seed. So that is the purpose of Israel. Israel was to be the kingdom of priests. That was supposed to be its job, to take the message of God to our, throughout all the other nations. But what's happening here? Well, Romans is showing that Israel is flagging. Israel is failing in its responsibilities. Israel is not repenting. So, Paul says here, not as though the word of God had taken none effect. Why did he say that right there? Because he's just finished telling us, uh, giving us a complete, not a complete, but a very pointed summary of what Israel was before God. 
with all these things to do with the adoption and the glory and the service and the temple and all these great things. And then he says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect. Somehow Paul has to answer, how is God's word working in the face of a obvious rebellion of Israel? That's what's going on. How is it? How is God's word still correct and true in the face of an Israel that's going against what Christ is and who he is and what he's proclaiming? Okay. And it goes on and he says very interesting things. So today what I'm going to do is I just want to lay the land out and then we'll go back next Sunday and I'm going to start with a very careful verse by verse. So I just want to show you the lay of the land here, first of all. Then it goes on down. It says uh, this in uh, verse uh, 9. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, <clears throat> even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil that the purposes that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works but of him that calleth ah now this is where the Calvinist will live the Calvinist will say here it is man this shows you this complete election of God which was just made by him and that's all there is to it. There's one elect, and there's one elect group, and then there's the reprobate. Look what it says. See, look what it says here. Uh, it says, uh, verse 11, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil. See, they hadn't done anything. That the purpose of God according to election. My question is, what is the purpose of God according to election? Well, it's given to you in Genesis chapter 12. Because the context here is Israel. You see, one of the big problems we let the Calvinists get away with is to shift the, the context. The context here is not about personal salvation. The context here is about Israel in the face of hardening. All right? That's the context. And as it goes down here, it says this in verse 12, It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Yeah. Now, does this mean that it's Jacob, the one person that I have deemed to save? And Esau, the one person, have I deemed not to save? That he's going to hell, he's going to be burned forever in the traditional hell? Is that what it's all about? No. It's not. We will find and discover that this, in context, is talking about two nations. And we have discovered already with our study on election, that it's quite possible that God can separate a group of people and show mercy to a group of people and have an elective purpose for a group of people, and yet some of them in there rebel against him. And he ends up not loving he didn't love every single individual inside Israel who finally says no to him. In the end, they've got to take the wrath of God. Similarly, for those who are in Edom, Esau is going to represent Edom. So we're going to discover some really important truths about this here, which uh, uh, in its context I think is important. And it says this. In verse 15, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. What do the Calvinists do? Personal salvation. In their mind, they're thinking about personal salvation. But wait a minute. Haven't we just discovered that this is the context? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will harden whom I will harden. Ah, oh, yes. But those people on which he is hardening, didn't they have a free will choice? Didn't they have the opportunity to believe God, believe on the Messiah? Yes, they do. All that God is doing now is He's going to use their hardening and use them for His 
purposes, greater purposes, but he did not make them rebel against him in the first place. He's simply using their rebellion for a greater purpose. And what we in this church have to offer people is the fact that we can explain what greater purpose that is. And I think it's absolutely magnificent that we can do that. Now, I've seen some other preachers explain this, but they cannot clarify what the purpose is. And we can. We can do it. And I think it's a great thing. And it goes on down. It says in verse 17, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. Okay, so now the example of Pharaoh is going to explain this. And when we see, and we go back, to Genesis and we look at Pharaoh, what we're going to find is we're going to find that Pharaoh hardened himself in some passages and then in other passages it says, and God hardened Pharaoh. Both are true. How can it be true? Because Pharaoh is a rebellious guy. Pharaoh decided to go against the witness of the prophets before him. Why? Because God deemed that he would do that? No, God simply used his rebellion and used this for his greater glory to, to bring about this great Passover, right? Okay, and you, you go on down, you'll see this. And now coming down to verse 21, I'm just trying to pick out the highlights so you can see that there's something going on here that you may have missed. Look at verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Again, if you put it into the personal salvation thing, you're going to get Calvinism. You'll get Calvinism out of that. But if you put it into the context, you find it here in Romans. What's going on here? Well, again, this goes back to the, the Pharaoh here. Look what it says here. It says, making one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Ooh. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. What is the lump? See, what is the lump? And the Calvinist has got such an influence on our mind, believe it or not, through the books and everything else that we've been taught through preachers, through the ages, the Calvinist has really got our minds on a lot of this. But if you keep this in the context, the lump is simply Israel in its stages of rebellion. And from this lump, of Israel, God can form what, what He wishes for His purposes. He can show mercy on some, and He can show hardening on the others. Hardening their own rebellion. That's the lump. It's not personal salvation. That's how we see it. We put ourselves in it. You can't. You've got to leave it as Israel. If you leave it as Israel, it makes sense. Are you, are you guys with me on this? This is quite a big thing. I mean, maybe it's Obvious. It kind of looks obvious when you explain it like this and you set it in its context. But if you look at commentaries, believe me, this is all personal salvation as it's deemed. And it says, says this um, and down here, um, verse 24, Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So now he's going to extend this thing, which is what I want to bring you to as we go through this. So this is my kind of like summary of what's going on. Actually, I think I've got a slide here, so I might as well show you uh, the slide. Um, you know, I've had this thing here that uh, you can find online. It's got uh, some of the 20th century's uh, great Calvinists, and there's lots of them. Um, and they love Romans 9. Romans 9, that's it, man. Well, here's my picture, which is similar to what I've got there. So here... Um, this is what's going on. The first part is what you see in the Gospels. John 6, Matthew 13, the introduction of the parables. Yeah, that's what's going on. There's a hardening for a greater purpose. There's still mercy being shown. Over here at the beginning when the Spirit's given, multitudes come in. Multitudes will see the miracles. Wow! Then there's hardening. They themselves move against the witness of the gospel. And there's hardening. Why? For a greater purpose, which is the revelation of 
the mystery, the mystery given to Paul the prisoner. During this time, do you find mercy? Yeah, there are still some getting saved here. Yes, they are still getting saved here. But it does not presuppose in either situation this idea that there was some elect group from before the foundation of the world that God is going to save and a reprobate class whom God is going to damn. Not in the context. Not there. I think this is going to be a good study. As I said, I wanted to give you kind of like an overview today. And then uh, next Sunday... I'm going to go verse by verse because by then I would have made my own translation and I have a lot more to say about some of the verbs and things, some of the uh, great passages here. Okay, well, that's cool. That's it from me. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time, Lord, and for the ministry that we find in the Scriptures about uh, the hardening of Israel and how that uh, there was a great purpose during the Gospels period, that Christ would go to the cross and, and that thou hast used the rebellion of Israel to accomplish a greater purpose. And also, Lord, through the book of Acts, a greater purpose is being put in motion, and that is the salvation of God being sent to the Gentiles under the economy of, the economy of Paul the prisoner where the revelation of the mystery is given. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.